Welcome to the Happier and Healthier Podcast. I'm your host, Maria Marlowe, and this is a place where we don't rely on good luck or good genes for our health and happiness, but rather we create it with our thoughts and our actions each and every single day. Each week, I'll bring you a thought or a guest that will help you live your happiest and healthiest life. Are you ready? If you've ever cooked any of the recipes over on mariamarlo.com, you know that I absolutely love spices and use them very generously. Not only do they add flavor and color, but they also offer a plethora of health benefits. One of my favorite things to do is learn about the health benefits of different foods. So to help me out today, I've invited Rosalie de la Forêt on the show. She's a registered herbalist and is an absolute wealth of knowledge around the benefits of culinary herbs. So you have a whole medicine cabinet sitting in your kitchen right now. If you have oregano, thyme, rosemary, turmeric, black pepper, all of these things have incredible health benefits, which I feel like we often overlook or we just don't even realize how medicinal these herbs, these spices can actually be. So Rosalie is going to help us out today. She's going to share some of the incredible benefits and how we can incorporate more spices and herbs into our life in a very practical way. Rosalie is the author of the best-selling book, Alchemy of Herbs, Transforming Everyday Ingredients into Foods and Remedies that Heal, and co-author of Wild Remedies, How to Forage Healing Foods and Craft Your Own Herbal Medicine. This episode is brought to you by The Clear Skin Plan, my 90-day program and meal plan to clear your skin from within naturally. If you've suffered with acne for months, years, or even decades, it's time to look within. Chronic acne is seldom a topical problem, but rather a sign of an internal imbalance and inflammation. Discover your root causes and remedy them with simple dietary and lifestyle changes. Head to mariamarlo.com forward slash clear dash skin dash plan to start today. Rosalie, thanks for coming on the show. Oh, I'm just so happy to be here, Maria. Thanks for having me. So one thing that I love about your approach to herbs is that you're very practical with it and really encourage the use of culinary herbs and the herbs in our kitchen. In fact, many of us are already cooking with things like rosemary and thyme and oregano. We don't even realize that we're that we're using these herbs, right? So I would love for you to share what are some of the secrets of these common herbs that we're already working and using, you know, in our kitchen? Absolutely. Yeah. I think for most people, they don't need to look much further beyond their kitchen cabinet and their spices to get really wonderfully healing herbs and spices into their life. And I'm excited today to share some of my favorites and maybe, you know, share some things that people don't know about in terms of how they can be worked with and the best ways to get the benefits from them. Because sometimes, you know, it's different from saying like, oh, turmeric is good for inflammation and then like actually getting results with turmeric. So we can kind of dive into that in both aspects today. Yes. Yeah. Because the dose makes a difference for sure. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure the cooking method, I know some herbs and spices, they're better heated up a little bit. We'll extract some more of those active components that we want. So why don't you share with us your top five favorite herbs, culinary herbs and what they're good for? All right. That sounds like a good plan. I'll start with my top five favorites today because I don't like to make the other herbs jealous, you know, by (laughs) singling out the five, but there are so many to choose from. And maybe we could start with cinnamon because I feel like cinnamon is something that's probably in everybody's cabinet and it's easy to love because it tastes so delicious. And it's something that we can't really imagine pastries without. And cinnamon is just this incredibly healing, wonderful herb with so many different uses. It's very famous for helping to address blood sugar issues. So people who have high blood sugar, it can be used temporarily to reduce high fasting glucose levels. And that is something, you know, it's not a long-term solution. It's not like healing any underlying cause, but It's something that can be called upon on the short term to reduce those high fasting blood glucose levels. Lots of interesting studies looking at that and people 
who are even pre-diabetic with type two diabetes and how that can help be like a part of the regimen for their health journey. But probably the most common way that I recommended cinnamon is for menstrual cramps. And it is a fabulous thing that just, it doesn't work for everybody out there, but it works for a lot of people. And how you take it is about three days before your period starts, you take anywhere from two to six grams of cinnamon per day. So that's like, you know, four to 12 capsules or so. I always recommend starting low. You never want to just like take a whole bunch of something new all of a sudden. So you start low, slowly increase, but you start that days before your period. And for people who get lots of cramping, this can be a way to actually reduce that cramping. And I've seen that work for so many people who used to take lots of ibuprofen or other NSAIDs to help mitigate you know, PMS pain. The cinnamon was just like the trick. So you do have to take it early. It's not something like, oh, I feel crampy. I'm going to take it right now and then expect it to work. It's something you have to take early on. Yeah, that's so interesting. I've actually never heard that. I, of course, love cinnamon. It is delicious. It has so many benefits, but that's the first time hearing that. So that's definitely cool to note. Good to know. Yeah. And just even getting into the habit of using it every day, not even, you know, the week before or something, but like, you know, using it in your cereal and for breakfast or your tea, right? Mm-hmm. Well, what are some of the ways that you you recommend incorporating the cinnamon into the diet? Mm-hmm. Well, so having like a little bit with food is a great way. Cause like you said, you know, it's best to get it in every day and their cinnamon, like most herbs is really high in antioxidants, which helps mitigate chronic inflammation. And so that, you know, is great to add to little bits when you're wanting like a specific health outcome, you might need more than like is really tasty (laughs) necessarily. But as to your question of like how to get it into foods, one of my favorite ways, and this is just a simple thing is to have yogurt and fruit and put cinnamon in that. And that's just like a lovely way to you know, get that cinnamon flavor with all sorts of other yummy things. We often think of cinnamon as something for sweet, but cinnamon is commonly used in savory foods too. So it can be used in sauces um, on meats or vegetables. So that's another way. Another interesting way that we can invite cinnamon into our life is as a tooth powder. So back in the day before we had toothpastes, powders were actually what was used to you know, kind of brush the teeth with. And so all you need is cinnamon. You can add other stuff like charcoal if you wanted, but you could just take cinnamon and wet your toothbrush, dip your toothbrush in some cinnamon powder, and then brush your teeth as normal. And your teeth feel so smooth and there's lots of antimicrobial properties in cinnamon. It's also slightly astringent, which means it's tightening and toning to tissues, which is beneficial for the gums. We get those tightened and toned. So lots of benefits for cinnamon. And of course, cinnamon essential oil is often added to lots of products like floss and toothpaste, but I like the whole herb and just, you know, getting lots of it where it counts. Oh, that's such a fun idea. Another thing for me to try. (laughs) That sounds cool. All right. So cinnamon, definitely making sure to keep that stocked. What else should we have in our kitchen? Well, probably the most popular spice in the world is one that I think is also just kind of strangely underrated and that's black pepper. And I feel like black pepper is so common that it's almost, you know, overlooked in some ways. And then we have all sorts of different kinds of black pepper, whether you're like at a diner and there's like the really old powder, <laughs> you know, that's like gray on the table, or you're like in fine dining and the maitre d' is like, would you like some freshly ground pepper on your salad? There's, you know, different ways of <laughs> enjoying the pepper, but freshly ground pepper is best. And I think that this is one that we need to take a new look at and be re-inspired to add to all of our meals because black pepper enhances our digestion and makes other foods that it's consumed with more bioavailable. So it's like, if you're going to be eating lots of whole foods that are organic, cost lots of money, you might as well get, you know, the biggest bang for your buck by adding black pepper to the meal and then getting a lot more nutrients from that meal, just because your body is able to better digest those nutrients that you're already eating. Yeah, that's so interesting. And I think the one that we hear about a lot, we often hear that you should pair turmeric with black pepper for that very reason so that you get the maximum benefits from your turmeric. But yeah, black pepper is great for digestion and it helps us digest. So it makes sense that if we're digesting better, we're absorbing things better as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it, you know, it has, you know, a nice flavor and it warms up digestion. So it's, just generally beneficial for digestion in that way. 
it's seen as a stimulant, like a warming stimulant. And so wonderful for people who have cold hands and feet, because that's a way that you can get circulation moving and address that. It's commonly used for arthritis pain, can be used topically or lots internally, and also used a lot for colds and flus. A lot of our stimulating pungent spices like black pepper, ginger, garlic, those are often used for colds and flus. Like when we're feeling kind of cold and stagnant and things are stuck, those spices get things moving again. And so how much pepper do we need? Do we have to like make our food black, you know, to get, uh, yeah. to get enough pepper or yeah. how much is, how much, what's the right around a good amount? Yeah. Well, the good news is we don't need that much. And I would say always with kitchen medicine, we do it to pleasure. So and that can be a varying amount for different people from people who are like, no, I'll think I'll pass on black pepper to people who are like, yeah, I could use a little or people are like, yeah, give it to me. So I would say go with your comfort level. In studies looking at how black pepper enhances bioavailability of curcumin, an extract of turmeric, it was shown that 3% of black pepper to turmeric was the like the golden part there. So that's not that much, you know, it's like a little bit. So freshly ground black pepper, add it to meals. We have a couple of different places in the house where we eat food and I keep a black pepper, you know, fresh black pepper grinder there at every single location. So it's just natural to add that as like a finishing spice. Yeah. And if you are used to buying the ground pepper, if you switch to the grinder, I mean, the flavor is completely different. It's like a flavor explosion when you have Mm -hmm. the fresh brown black pepper. It's so Mm -hmm. bright and it really elevates the dish. Whereas I feel like sometimes I'm lazy. And if you're, you know, you have a recipe where you have to put in half a teaspoon of black pepper or something, like I don't want to grind that all. So I'll use the ground. But it, it tastes like nothing. It yeah, it's like so anything. true. Yeah, that gr- yeah. And when you grind it up, it just loses its pizzazz so quickly. Yeah, and they have yeah. all sorts of fancy pepper grinders now. So you can do a super coarse if you like it like that, or you know, you can grind it really mm-hmm. finely. So it's worth finding one of those, I think, so you can get it exactly how you want it or change it for recipes as desired. Yeah, so I'm a huge fan of the fresh black pepper grinder. Okay, what else? What else should we have? Or well, we, should we, we know about the spices? Yeah, we can't overlook turmeric, which we've mentioned. And I know, you know turmeric is the most studied herb, probably the, one of the most popular herbs that isn't underrated in the same way that black pepper might be. And of course, it's one of its most uh, biggest claims of fame is to modulate inflammation. And with inflammation being such a big part of many chronic illnesses. Turmeric has just been looked at in all sorts of avenues, whether it's for heart health, digestive health, supporting the liver, cognitive health, and on and on and on. I mean, there's pretty much like you can go to PubMed, which is a research database and type in like turmeric and then whatever body system you want. And I guarantee you there's there's been some study on it. It is just amazing how much people love to study this herb. And so because you know, we know that it works. We know it works well. We know it modulates inflammation. Maybe I could share some things that are maybe lesser known about turmeric. One, I would like to say that turmeric is not for everyone. Like it gets kind of touted as like the herb for inflammation. And it certainly is very impressive, but some people don't play well with turmeric. And sometimes I think that all the attention turmeric gets, then someone, you know, they find out that turmeric isn't their herb. It can be kind of like disheartening, but there are so many herbs out there that modulate chronic inflammation. So if you take turmeric and it upsets your belly or, you know, just somehow it's not for you, that's not the end of the world. Another thing about turmeric is kind of like how we talked about with cinnamon. With cinnamon, you can have a little bit in your meals every day. And there's so many benefits that getting all those phytonutrients, all those antioxidants, that's a wonderful health practice. Same goes for turmeric. There's probably, I couldn't tell you the last time I didn't have turmeric in a day, right? It's something that's always a part of my life. But if you are wanting to work with turmeric for, you know, different results, like specific results, like I've seen turmeric work wonders, for example, for arthritis. I've seen people who could barely move their hands due to arthritis and work with turmeric and regain function and have less pain just in their everyday life. But to do that, you really have to up the dosage for turmeric as much as 10 grams a day, which just to give you a you know, estimate that's like 20 capsules. That's a lot of turmeric. The issue that happens when you get taking that much turmeric is you get some adverse effects sometimes, and that is really dryness. Turmeric is super drying. So what that means is people who may already have like have dryness in their cells, 
then they might notice that exacerbated. So they might wake up with a really dry mouth and then they'll drink water throughout the day. The water doesn't help. Like it's just, they have a dry mouth where they might notice like their hair becomes really dry or their skin is dry. Dry eyes is a big one too, because the eyes can get dried out really quickly. And so that can be another one. And I'll, I'll have people come to me and just like, you know, they'll tell me that like, oh, I just, I put eye drops in my eyes all day long and they're just still so dry. And it turns out, you know, they're taking five grams of turmeric every day, which is helping with their arthritis, but, you know, causing these other situations. So that's something to look out for. And for some people who are already super dry, turmeric might not be the best choice, or you can formulate turmeric to kind of offset that drying quality. One of the ways that's done with is that turmeric is often used heated. As you mentioned, some herbs are done well when they're heated. Turmeric is one of them. And heating that with an oil and then having that with other moistening foods. So a traditional way to enjoy turmeric is as golden milk. Golden milk is turmeric and other spices, black pepper, cardamom sometimes that can be sauteed in oil and then that made into a paste and that paste can be added to a milk of your choice, whether that's like a dairy milk or some other kind of oat milk, almond milk, your your choice. And so that is like this wonderfully moistening formula that offsets that dryness a bit. Other ways is we can just even look at our whole day of just, you know, are, are we eating moistening foods? You know, some people who already have dryness might benefit from eating more okra or <laughs> eggplant or things that are moistening or just something simple like, you know, am I getting enough healthy fats? Am I getting enough hydration? That sort of thing. So so it's just something to think about with turmeric. Sometimes more is better, but sometimes when we get more, there's a few problems there. So we just want to offset that. The thing about side effects with herbs is that they often are pretty minor. You know, there can be some, you know, some cases where there is a big problems, but it's so rare, you know, that there's big problems. It's kind of like, oh, I feel some dryness. Oh, I'll, I'll do something to, to fix that dryness. But it's good to be aware of it just so we can fix it. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. And that's why it's also can be so useful to work with an herbalist who can tell you that because like, for example, I didn't know that I had no idea that too much turmeric could be drying. So I I would never pick up on that. But like someone like you who knows these herbs in and out, you'd be able to say, Oh, yeah, what you're eating, what five grams of turmeric that you know, let's let's try this instead. This is this is why this is happening. Make sure you're having moist foods, whatever. I have to say with the turmeric milk, I know that was so trendy. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's still trendy. But even just a couple of years ago, I feel like it came, became trendy. I cannot have warm milk. I think it's it just <laughs> repulses me so much. Mm -hmm. So I love to um, I cook with it all the time. So mm. I will add it to I mean, I add it to pretty much everything I cook whenever I'm stir frying something. I'll add it. I love it with cumin also. And black pepper, of course, but I'll do it like in curries or Thai curries or just garlic and oil. And I just feel like when I put it in that, you can see it, but I, I don't feel like it has a very strong flavor. Mm -hmm. So as long as you have other flavors in there, it just tastes like whatever else you're making it with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You reminded me one of my, I actually am not a super big fan of warmed milk either, but in the winter time, sometimes I'll like golden milk a bit. But one of my favorite things with a golden milk preparation is my husband makes a coconut milk based ice cream. And then he uses the golden milk paste to flavor that and just sweetens it with a little bit of honey. And that is really yummy. And it's pretty too, because it has that you know, yeah. bright orange color from the turmeric. That sounds good. Yeah, yeah. that I would try. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Okay. So what else? What else is in our spice cabinet? What else? Well, if we're talking about antioxidants a lot, so we could talk about rosemary which is, I feel like so many people love rosemary uh, on their own. You know, it's just such an easy herb to love. If you can grow rosemary, you can sometimes create this big hedge and it has these beautiful purple flowers on it that pollinators love. My husband's family is from France. And so we visit France a fair bit. And the first time we went to Southern France together and I saw rosemary growing like a weed out of like cracks <laughs> in the you know, sidewalks or, you know, in between stones. That was just so impressive. I was just like, wow, this is a cool thing to see, you know, rosemary in its native habitat of the Mediterranean. So sometimes rosemary is called the queen of antioxidants because it's so full of antioxidants. And in that, because of it, it's used in some interesting ways. They've created extracts of rosemary that they use as a preservative in a lot of foods. So that's kind of fascinating to me. It's like this 
you know, massive use of, of rosemary beyond like the grass where roots are blissed, beyond your potatoes <laughs> kind of thing. And let's see, one of my favorite applications for rosemary is actually to protect the skin from UV damage. And it can work in a couple ways for that. You can use it topically as just, you know, protection from the skin on that, infuse it into oils, use it as a face cream. And then also simply by using it internally too, so much of our, you know, the health of our skin and even UV protection comes from the inside out. And so having rosemary frequently in our lives is a wonderful way to do that as well. And of course it's famous for potatoes and adding a little bit here and there. It is something that's, it is a spice you want to add like just enough of to foods because you can overdo it and then can have a little, you know, too perfumey or kind of too bitter of a taste to it. So you just got to figure out what's the good amount for you. But I do recommend like, if you already cook with rosemary, add your normal amount and then add a little bit more and just see how that goes. And over time, like add a little bit more. I'm always into like, what's the maximum amount you can use that it still tastes good. I'm not talking about like destroying a meal for you or your family, uh, but you know, <laughs> where does it get that, that it tastes uh, still tastes good? I um, feel like with herbs, personally, I always feel like the more the merrier. I'm sure there's definitely a <laughs> There, there's a ledge there somewhere, but I'm just like, bring it on. But that brings up a question, even with the turmeric, what about using the fresh herb versus the dried, mm -hmm. uh, like in terms of potency and all of this stuff? So maybe just starting with rosemary because we're on rosemary. Mm -hmm. Does it make a difference if we're using the fresh rosemary versus the dried rosemary? Mm -hmm. Good question. With most herbs, I say, use all of it <laughs> every which way you can. So if you only have access to dried, use the dried, but generally dried and fresh have different gifts. And so getting both of them into your life is a great way to do that. And with the fresh rosemary, you know, the fresh rose rosemary just has this bright, fresh flavor that I think is so fun to work with. And I love making pastes with fresh rosemary. I love adding it. They're making tapenade recipes, which are olives and anchovies and rosemary and thyme and olive oil, you know, mix that up. And the fresh rosemary is really, you know, so a consistency thing there. Fresh rosemary is great. With dried herbs, interestingly, is that when you dry an herb, it helps break down the cell wall, which means that it makes them more bioavailable. So if we're going to make a tea out of them, for example, or add them to meals, they can actually get, we can have more nutrients from them if we dry them first. And I could also say just different because again, the drying process will change things a bit. I would say overall, you want to have the freshest spices and herbs possible. So for anyone listening to this and you're in, you know, thinking like, oh yeah, I really want to up my game on herbs and spices. And if you have a bunch of herbs and spices that you haven't really looked at and they might be a couple of years old, you're not alone, that happens. But my recommendation is to go to your spice cabinet give everything a smell. If something doesn't wow you and you know the color might be off, like if it's not bright green the way it should be or vibrant smell, put that in the compost and go get some fresh herbs and spices. And that, you know, just like Maria was saying with the black pepper, you know, fresh, whole black pepper grounded. I mean, that just makes such a huge difference. So however, if you're going to use them dried, make sure that they're, they've been harvested and dried recently and they're not a couple of years old. Yeah, that's a great tip because it does make such a difference in the flavor. And of course, I'm sure that benefits as well. And when you see spices that have that vibrant, bright color, like the cayenne peppers or the paprikas that are like that bright, deep, dark red versus the ones that are like a dusty brown, like yeah. kind of, <laughs> yeah. they, there's a huge, huge difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there really is. And what about oregano? Because this is another one I feel like most of us have, and we use it a lot in Italian cooking. So mm -hmm. yeah, tell us a little bit about oregano. Yes, oregano. So oregano is highly antimicrobial and it's become kind of famous as a essential oil or oil of oregano. And people use that both topically and internally as an antimicrobial. But I'll admit, I'm not a huge fan of that because it's so intense. I mean, it, if you put that in a sensitive area, it will burn. And I've worked with several people who were taking it internally and they overdid it. And it just kind of, I think it disrupted their gut flora because they ended up with diarrhea for long term. So that one's, I'm kind of like caution on the oil of oregano. No doubt that it's potent, but I think the whole herb itself is super potent. And that's, if you taste a fresh oregano leaf, like just have a little, if you have the opportunity to find a fresh oregano plant, 
tastily put that on your tongue. It's hot. Like it's very hot. Uh, like a chili pepper is hot. It's very potent. And so I like working with the whole herb on that. And because of that antimicrobial process, there's a lot of different ways we can work with it. One of my favorites is as a mouthwash. And that can be, you can use it as a tea, as a mouthwash, uh, or you can make it as an alcohol extract or tincture, and which is then preserved. You can add that to a bit of water and just swish with it. So it's a wonderful way just to maintain oral health or you know, if you want to address something uh, going on in the mouth. So that's a fabulous way to do that. Also, I feel like, you know, kind of like broken record, very high in antioxidants, which is great for modulating inflammation, but it really is. So oregano is actually one, another one that's, you know, touts being one of the highest antioxidant herbs. So getting even a little bit of that into our meals all the time is a wonderful way to get more antioxidants in. And it's because of that warming that, you know, like pretty like significantly warming, it's really great for digestion and it's kind of great for a lot of things in digestion and it's like antimicrobial, but it doesn't kill healthy gut flora, but that warming flavor stimulates digestion. It's pleasing for us. So we get to enjoy our digestive medicine, um, as well. So yeah, that's some ways to use oregano and like we've already been talking about use a little and increase a little bit and increase a little bit and see how it goes. Yeah. I feel like I go through my spices so quickly and I love my spices. Like they're the pride and joy of my kitchen, but actually, do you want to share a little bit on storing your spices? Because I feel like sometimes Mm. they come in these really pretty bottles and we want to leave them on the counter, but it's probably not the best idea. Yeah. Yeah. Or the worst actually is when you store them like right above your stove or right next to your stove, that's bad too. So with, with spices, they can actually keep their potency for a good amount of time if they're stored well. So ideal storage for spices are in a dark location, in a cool location, dry. So if you live in a humid place, then you want to have like them in a tightly sealed container. So for example, like I love the beautiful, like jars with the corks on them so pretty and you want like you said you want those on your cabinet but no that's not really a good way to go unless you're like if you're going through that like in two days maybe but you know for all intents and purposes so yeah cool dark place there really are better in the cabinet rather than out um, and about I know that's so sad, but yes, I keep all my, uh, all my spices in a dark closed cabinet, but I like to take them out, you know, when I'm cooking, enjoy them then and just put them back. Yeah. yeah. Is there anything you wish people knew about spices that you think people don't know or any maybe misconceptions or just, yeah, anything mm-hmm. that we, that you want people to know about spices? Sure. Well, one thing we've been talking about is kind of the difference of, or just the benefits of getting spices and herbs in your life every day and then therapeutic doses. But I don't think we could really accentuate how beneficial it is to get them in your everyday life. And one way of thinking about that is discussing the phytonutrients. So herbs and spices have so many phytonutrients. And what I mean by that word is we think about like what's in the things we eat. You know, we know that there's micronutrients and macronutrients. So things like, you know, protein and fiber, things like vitamins and minerals. And when I grew up, that was kind of like what we learned about in nutrition were those things, right? These macro and micronutrients. Phytonutrients and the awareness of those has really grown in the past couple of decades and just how important it is to have a wide abundance of phytonutrients in our lives. So we're often told like when we eat vegetables and fruits, like get the whole, get the color of the rainbow, and eat many different kinds, which is wonderful, wonderful advice. But we're kind of limited. You know, like when you go to the grocery store, it's not like there's 50 different vegetables to choose from, right? Like if you're in a nice place with a lot, you know, good growing season, maybe there's 20. I don't know, I'm making that up. But there's just, there's going to be a limited amount. Our ancestors, especially think back, you know, 10,000 years ago, in some places it's estimated they're eating 800 different kinds of fruits and vegetables throughout the year. And there's no way that we're getting even close to that today because we have our staples, you know, the potatoes, tomatoes, <laughs> salads, etc. So a wonderful way to increase the diversity of phytonutrients into our lives is by using lots of herbs and spices. And there's so many of them that we can choose from. And so what 
basically what that means is that when you're eating, it's kind of like if you imagine eating like a roasted vegetables that has potatoes and carrots and beets. Wonderful stuff, right? Awesome. And there's phytonutrients in those roasted vegetables. Then we could add rosemary. And all of a sudden we've just dramatically increased the phytonutrient profile. We could add black pepper to that. Um, oregano and thyme would fit in well with there. And all of a sudden, you know, we just exponentially increase the phytonutrient. What that's doing is that diversity in our digestive system, in our whole body is so good because it's opening up different metabolic pathways. And it's just kind of waking up our body and stimulating our body in different ways. Because the interesting thing about herbs, it's not like we eat herbs and then they heal us, right? What happens actually is we, we take in herbs into our body and our bodies react to those herbs in a way. And it's that dance between the two that creates all of these beneficial reactions. So the more you know, diversity we have, the more different ways our bodies are interacting with all of those herbs and spices, the more health benefits there are. And you just can't replace that in any way. You know, in the herbalist world, people love tinctures and alcohol extracts, and certainly those have a time and place. But when I think about in our meals, I'm like holding up a handful, like we have a handful of herbs that go into each meal that there's, just, and then there's, you know, two or three meals a day. So that's so much every single day that you just can't replace with like a couple squirts of an alcohol tincture. Plus it's a lot more fun to eat all of those herbs and spices. So yeah, so that's, I guess I I just can't accentuate enough how important it is to, to look at each meal and even beverages as this opportunity to get lots of different herbs and spices in. We do a lot of Indian food here in my home and I'll kind of a running joke is all my husband does a lot of that cooking and I'll ask him like, Oh, this, you know, this is so good. What spices are in here? And he just looks at me and goes, all of them. <laughs> <And> <laughs> another thing that we do is we play like how many sources of phytonutrients are in this meal. And that's something that I encourage people to do. So again, it's kind of like if you have roasted potatoes and beets and carrots, we're just talking sources because we can't count all those phytonutrients, right? Because there might be hundreds within them, but there's three there. And it's like, how many herbs and spices can you add? And we know that we're doing a good job when each, when our meal, our entire meal, including the beverage and everything, when we get over 20 different sources of phytonutrients. And it's fun to play that and just see, you know, like, oh, right, right now I get seven. Great. You know, get to 10, get to 12 and see how it goes all while enjoying it, of course. I love that game. That sounds so fun. And uh, I think it raises a great point, which is that I do feel we are overall as a society quite disconnected from our food because for most of us, we're not gardening. We're definitely not foraging for our food. We're going to the grocery store. We're buying it. We're putting it together quickly. And something like spices, people may think, oh, they're just kind of there to flavor the food, not realizing the tremendous potential that these spices have and the tremendous amount of antioxidants that they can provide and phytochemicals, phytonutrients. So it's a great reminder that even, even in their teeny tiny little amounts, they can make a huge impact. So I love, I love that tip. And I love, I love that game that you play (laughs) uh, to make it, make it a little bit more fun. So speaking of that, I know that you are a proponent of gardening and foraging even. So let's start with gardening. Uh, I know you're an avid gardener. If for someone who's new to gardening or maybe wants to start a garden, what are some of your favorite plants or or tips to to get started there? Mm -hmm. Oh, fun. We get to talk about gardening. It's like right now, it's like most of my life is consumed with gardening this season. And the, the great thing about gardening herbs is that you can grow so many of them in pots. So if you don't have access to a, a big plot of land or a big garden, you can easily grow lots of herbs in pots. And the other thing is that many herbs thrive on neglect. So they actually get stronger in their health benefits, like the less you pamper them. Oh, that's good. (laughs) Does everyone hear (laughs) that? (laughs) I feel like everyone talks about how they kill plants all the time, you know, because they forget about them, but it's actually a good thing. Yeah. Well, yeah, you couldn't go too far. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I was talking about rosemary growing in the Mediterranean and so many of our, my favorite herbs are from the Mediterranean, like thyme and oregano and rosemary. 
and lavender. And the soil there in the Mediterranean is just rocks. Like there's not like actually a lot of soil. So they're just growing out of those limestone rocks that it's this harsh summers and yeah, anyway, so it's in cool winters, but it's life is tough there. So, and they, and because of that, that's why these plants develop what we call secondary metabolites, which are often those phytonutrients that we then benefit from. So the, the more a plant struggles, often the more medicinal it can be. And then the more it's pampered, it doesn't need to produce that. So it's kind of like us, you know, if we are sedentary, then our muscles don't grow. But if we do lots of strength training, then we're then, you know, challenging our body and our muscles are growing kind of similar to that. So yes, gardening. Well, you know, one of my favorite things to garden, which I'm just so in love with right now is chives and chives are so beautiful right now. Mine are in full flower. So they're covered in these purple blossoms and the pollinators love them. And so that's fun to watch, but chives are, you know, they're spicy, they're pungent, they're related to garlic and onions, but those green, but instead of eating the bulbs, we eat the green leaves and those green leaves are actually higher in antioxidants than garlic and onions. So lots of benefits there. They're so easy to use. They're kind of famous for like the sour cream and potatoes. That's like where people most think of as chives. You can add chives to just about everything. And this time of year, we pretty much do. It kind of is like the final topping for almost everything we eat. And those purple flowers are beautiful. They can be eaten as well. I love infusing them into gar or into vinegar. Make your own salad dressing. It turns pink. But gardening chives is fun because, again, it grows in a container. It doesn't take a lot of work. It's a perennial, so it comes back year after year. And chives don't really last a long time. So you don't buy dried chives as something you want fresh. And I'm increasingly seeing it at like farmer's markets or in the fresh herb section of the grocery store. But they just really don't last that long. So if they've been sitting around for a while, you'll be able to tell. I just get like limp and not very appetizing looking. So chives is a really fun one to grow and have fresh access to that. And then of course, I love all of my oreganos and thymes and, and you know, also perennials also can grow in pots. And those are ones that you don't want to overwater. They like a lot of sun, but having those fresh is just a really wonderful culinary delight in the summertime, especially as the tomatoes come on and you get your fresh thyme and oregano. So those are lovely as well. And we didn't talk about sage, but sage is another favorite of mine. Sage, I feel like you know, we often just think of it as like the Thanksgiving herb, but sage has so many benefits. Wonderful for cognition. There's an old saying, like if sage grows in your garden, you will never die, which might be a bit of an exaggeration, but <laughs> just, it was so well revered in times past. So, and, you know, should not be limited to, you know, to November and we can have it all year round. It's one of its most famous uses is actually for hot flashes, mostly during menopause, but that's a wonderful one to grow. And I was surprised when I first started growing sage, I'd never really seen it, you know, through the seasons. Sage has these beautiful purple flowers, like these spikes of beautiful purple flowers. Mine are about to go into flower now. And so that's a really fun one to have around as well. And how, how would you recommend adding more sage into your diet, like a tea or mm -hmm. how do you cook with it? Cause I feel mm -hmm. like we just have no idea. You know, I, mm -hmm. I, I see like fried sage leaves. Sometimes those are a topping on like a soup or something mm -hmm. like that. Or again, during Thanksgiving, they're used in one or two dishes, but otherwise I really don't even know what I should be doing with it. Yeah. Well, you're going to, you stole my first one, which was like fried sage leaves are so yummy <laughs> and they look fancy. You serve it with cheese and then you, you know, <laughs> it's very fancy. The, I love sage on chicken and I'll make a, like a sage butter and then put that like in between the skin of the chicken and the chicken and cook that up. You mentioned tea and tea is a wonderful way to enjoy sage. I like it with a little bit of lemon and just a touch of honey. We didn't talk about rosemary tea, but that would, that's another one for teas. So those are some great ways, you know, that goes great with lots of meats, lots of veggies. And then of course, grains, you know, kind of what's the stuff, traditional stuffing, but sage does go well with those as well. Yeah. I just, I love herbs. I feel like I'm so excited when I go to the farmer's market here and there's so many interesting herbs. Like I just picked up this week, I picked up some blue licorice, which I've been making into mm -hmm. a tea and uh lemon balm. Uh, mm. And what else I got? 
I did get fresh oregano. So I am, I have surprisingly, I've never just eaten a leaf. I put it in my salad sometimes, or sometimes mm-hmm. I'll make a tea with the oregano, but I haven't actually tried eating the leaf. So I'm going to try that afterwards. That's a fun practice too, because you'll find that there's varying degrees of heat with oregano and the hotter they get, you'll know that's the more, you know, kind of potent leaves that there are. So I've done that a lot. And yeah, when you get really pampered oregano, it won't be nearly as hot as if it's kind of had to struggle a bit. Yeah, which brings up a question about hydroponics. A hydroponic, which is grown in a very regulated setting, I would imagine those are not going to be as nutritious as something that is farmed in the actual soil, getting the mm-hmm. the real sunlight and mm-hmm. uh, exposed to a variety of different conditions versus just everything that it needs. Yeah, I I would jump on that train probably too. I can't <laughs> say that I've had, you know, hydroponic herbs, but a, a great way to test things is what we call organoleptics and that's basically tasting. And so the more you, you know, if you taste something for the first time, you don't have anything to compare it to. So it's just taking in information like, oh, I'm tasting this leaf and this is how it tastes. But the more you taste and the more different situations you're going to get a, a sense of all the variability out there. It's kind of like wine, right? They, there's like the taste of sommeliers with the wine and they, you know, can taste the terroir and know all, you know, the different lands it was from or all these different tastes. The same thing is true for herbs, you know, taste them and get a sense of the variability in them. So that would be interesting to taste hydroponic herbs and compare them to other herbs and just see what the difference is. And that would be the best way to know like, oh, and then you can even just say it without judgment of like, oh, this tastes milder and like grass or <laughs> as this tastes potent and fragrant, you know, just like let that inform us. I love that. Yeah, I think using our senses to to ascertain, you know, the quality of something, of course, that that makes a lot of sense. So I know you're also a proponent of foraging food. In fact, you have a book, Wild Remedies, How to Forage Healing Foods and Craft Your Own Herbal Medicine. So can you share a little bit about that? And for someone who has never done that, mm-hmm. oh, you know, where, where do they begin? Yeah, so for me, foraging and um, sometimes it's called wild crafting, the there's medicine in that in so many different forms. There's the medicine of the things that we collect and bring home and enjoy. And there's also the medicine in nature connection. And for me, foraging and wild crafting isn't about somebody like going out and identifying something and then taking it and you know putting it in my basket, heading back home. It's about getting to know the whole ecosystem, being aware of seasonal cycles, being aware of how those cycles change from year to year. Um, being aware of the whole ecological connection. How do other insects and animals depend on this plant in the way that I depend on this plant? So that's, to me, like the greatest joy. And it's just like ever unfolding mystery of getting that closer and closer connection. And like you said earlier, when like sometimes we can be removed from our foods or removed from our spices, you know, there are these things that we, we buy. When we forage our foods, we're you know closing that gap and having that direct connection with the plants. And so when I reach for the things that I've either grown in my garden or foraged, I have that experience and I can remember, oh, I remember harvesting this on that summer's day and you know and what a beautiful experience that was. And that's the whole package of healing and medicine. You know, it's very different experience than like walking into Walgreens and like pulling something off the shelf and paying $7.49 for it and going home. Obviously, sometimes we have to do that. I'm not necessarily (laughs) bad mouthing that, but I'm just calling attention. That's a different experience than going out in the sunshine, getting, you know, to know a plant, learning to know it more deeply over the years, harvesting it, knowing how best to work with it with medicine, being able to interact with all of the other creatures that are outside as well. You know, that's yeah, very different experience and one that I just find to be profoundly healing on so many levels. Well, that's just it. Simply being in nature is healing without even consuming anything. Just simply being there, being in the garden, your feet on the ground, smelling the scent of the trees and the flowers, just that in and of itself is so beneficial for us. So yeah, yeah, really number one. And I guess I didn't really answer your question, Maria, when you asked like, how do you get started? (laughs) But that would be the great way to get started is to go outside and just get to know what's out there. And I often recommend starting 
with one plant and starting with a weed. There are ways to regeneratively and sustainably harvest native plants, but there's lots more considerations there in terms of wanting to make sure that we bring benefit to those plant populations and not harm. But when we start with weeds, we have a little, like, we have a lot more lead way. And it's not about bringing less respect to those plants, but knowing that like you're going to be hard pressed to do damage to a dandelion population. <laughs> it's going to be a hard thing to do. <laughs> so, and it's also nice with the weeds is because they grow everywhere. And so they're, it's not about necessarily like going off to the wilderness and the hills and, and finding, you know, these rare plants. It's about saying like, oh, what grows around me? What can I have connection with? What can I get to know? So in getting started, it's often, that's where we begin is start with one plant, get to know that plant, get to know that plant on all sorts of different levels. Um, you know, what is this plant as food? What is it as medicine? How, you know, how to learn to properly ID it, how to learn to where it might grow. You start to get a sense for things, you know, like, oh, like I bet, you know, I see this area of the park over there and I see the habitat. So I, you know, I know the plants that'll grow there because I'm, I'm getting to be aware of that. So those are some good places to start. Yeah. And dandelion. So that is a notorious weed, right? But it's also right. a very beneficial, beneficial herb, right? Yeah. If you like twisted my arm and said, you can only have access to one weed for the rest of your life, that would probably be the first one off my tongue. It is one of my most favorite plants. It's just insane to me that it is considered negative ever. And even more insane that homeowners literally spend billions, that's with a B, of dollars trying to eradicate this plant by putting poisons into the ground to kill it. I mean, it's just insane. And you know, a lot of those poisons are known to cause cancer. Interestingly, dandelion is being studied in Canada fairly extensively for its use against cancer. So just kind of one of those ironic things there. But yeah, dandelion is so incredibly nutritious and beneficial on so many levels. The leaves in the springtime are wonderfully bitter. As it progresses through the year, it can become like disastrously bitter in a way that isn't as much fun. But that tender spring growth is this wonderful bitter and bitter, that bitter flavor helps to stimulate our digestion and are, are you know, it's beneficial in many different ways in that regard. It's a one, the leaves are a wonderful diuretic, which is just a nice cleansing function. In France, a uh, dandelion is called pisson lit, which sounds so pretty. Uh, it means pee in the bed. So it's kind of like <laughs> the translation there is like, oh, okay. But it is a very strong diuretic. And, um, which again, you know, can be a beneficial thing. I love to make pesto with the leaves. You know, it's this like this bitter pesto. You can mix it with other things to offset that bitter taste, but I like it just straight up with, you know, your other pesto ingredients, um, nuts and uh, Parmesan cheese, olive oil, lemon, et cetera. Uh, but that's a lovely springtime treat. But every part of the dandelion has wonderful gifts. The flowers are really high in lutein. Um, the whole plant is really high in inulin, which is a, a prebiotic. So it's a wonderful uh, starch that helps feed our healthy gut flora. So that's a lovely benefit. The roots are super nutrient dense and uh, they can be, you know, stir fried and eaten in meals. Also wonderful medicine for the liver. And we could spend another hour talking about dandelion. <laughs> You're like, wow, <laughs> I didn't realize no, that I was this, opening up a can of worms, but <laughs> no, this is great. I love, I love learning all these things. And so my question is, Again, there's a disconnect. As a kid growing up, I remember seeing dandelions, the yellow flowers, right? But now as an adult, I see dandelion leaves in the health food store. Right. Is that the same exact yeah. plant? Like, I don't remember seeing mm -hmm. the actual leaves, those big leaves that I see mm -hmm. in the, the health food store. Is this the same or coming from the same place? Yeah, there's a lot of times in the health food store, there's a slightly different variety that's being sold with a, has like a red or garnet stem on it but mm -hmm. it's like a, a different variety of that same plant. They basically look the same. Wild dandelions will have a white stem and then the red garnet ones will have, um, sometimes they're called Italian dandelion is how they might be called. But they do. Okay. They still have that nice bitter flavor. Those ones are easy to harvest from the grocery store and then make pesto yeah. out of them or add them to salads. Of course, that's really yummy too. Yeah. And then there is this um, very popular 
or a common Lebanese dish that uses the the dandelion leaves and but they boil and blanch them first so it's not as bitter yeah so of course bitter flavors are so good for us uh but yeah just curious I mean, I guess there's still other benefits as well, but if we take out some of that bitter flavor, are we still getting the benefits? Mm -hmm. Well, so, you know, sometimes if that, if those dandelions are kind of progressed in the season, taking out a little bitterness might be a good thing because if they're, you know, a few, like if you take a bit of a bite of a dandelion and you're like, which I was just making a funny face. <laughs> that is not like what you're going for. <laughs> you're right? not going to eat it. Yeah. 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 So that might be a good thing, but dandelion leaves are incredibly high in all sorts of nutrients, notably calcium, magnesium, potassium, phosphorus. So super nutrient dense. So if you take away a little bit of the bitterness, but you're still getting all those nutrients, that's a good thing. Yeah. Well, this is so fun. I can talk to you for hours. Like I could just sit with you and do a one episode <laughs> on every plant, but So, well, one last question that I'd like to ask before you go is if you can leave our listeners with just one piece of advice to live a happier and healthier life, what would that be? What jumped into my mind was choose joy. And I, I think things are turning around right now, but in the alternative health world in the past, I feel like so much of what we were told was like, almost like punishment, like in order to be healthy, you needed to punish yourself, eat rice cakes and, you know, exercise for five hours or just whatever, you know, it was just the kind of like these like rules that were given. And now I just, I really think choosing joy and whatever that means to us and, and following that inspiration. So if someone's inspired after this talk to go explore herbs and spices more and add them to your meals, awesome. Do it with joy or to go spend time in nature. Wonderful. Go find the place where you're safe and comfortable and revel in the sound of birds and sunshine or whatever that is for you. Do it with joy, embrace it, share it with a friend. Also very important. And um, yeah, I think that's a good recipe for more health and well-being. Well, thank you so much. I couldn't agree more. If you do want to learn more about herbs, definitely check out Rosalie's books, Alchemy of Herbs and Wild Remedies, which I will link both of those in the show notes. You can also find her on Instagram or her website. And on Instagram, it's just Rosalie de la Foray. Yes, the perfect places right. to find me. And I also want to mention that I have a podcast as well that I just launched. So that's where oh, congrats. I... Thank you. Yeah. What, it's, what's it called? It's called Herbs with Rosalie. And it's about looking at herbs as food, as medicine, and through nature connection. Awesome. Well, we'll definitely have to check that out. Thank you again. It's such a pleasure. Thanks for having me, Maria.